Good afternoon. The Holman Boone Cap number 152, Fayetteville, Tennessee, and the Order of Confederate Rose would like to thank you for your attendance. We have quite a crowd here today. Here to memorialize two of our Confederate patriots, uh, I'd like to begin with a prayer, if we'd bow. Almighty God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, who by a voice from the heaven didst proclaim, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Multiply, we beseech thee, to those who rest in Jesus, the manifold blessings of thy love, that the good work which thou didst begin in them may be perfected unto the day of Jesus Christ. And of thy mercy, O heavenly Father, vouchsafe that we, who now serve thee here on earth, may at last, together with them, be found meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. For the sake of the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 
Amen. At the beginning of each meeting of the Holman Boone, Camp 152, we begin with the, uh, the salute to the Confederate flag. This may be a new experience for some of you. I hope that you have, have a program or able to, to share a program with someone to, to find the salute. And, and if you can't see it, perhaps you can follow along with us. We have several flags on display here. The, uh, the Naval Confederate Jack, the uh, Third National, the Stars and Bars. This in particular, we want to thank Ron Warren and his wife Linda for uh, making this replica of a, of a flag which was presented to the uh, men of the Confederacy by the, by the ladies of Fayetteville, Tennessee in 1862, I believe it was. And, and finally, another battle flag there on the end. So when we give our salute, we stretch our palm out, our right palm out. I salute the Confederate flag with affection, reverence, and undying devotion to the cause for which it stands. The Sons of Confederate Veterans is actually a descendant of the United Confederate Veterans, a group of, uh, a group of veterans who uh, wanted to get together for fellowship reasons. And in, uh, in 1896, and eventually, as some of our veterans weren't with us, uh, they broadened the scope to include the Sons. And here in Lincoln County, our, our first chapter our only, only chapter, our camp, as, our, as we call them, was the Holman Boone, which began in 1906. The Holman Boone Camp 152 lasted until 1923, and then went defunct, and then a few of us in 1993 decided that we'd like to do a little more to preserve some of the heritage of Lincoln County. The Sons of Confederate Veterans are not fanatics, but we are ardent defenders of our Confederate heritage. And we, we try with, with everything we have to, to make sure that the, there's accuracy and historical representation of our Confederate ancestors. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is James Larry Shelton. I'm sure many of you know me, but many of you don't. Uh, what I want to do today is uh, talk to you on why we should remember the Confederate veterans. Why should we remember? Why should we remember the war between the states? We sure we should, for it was a time when we, as a people, were distinguished from the rest of the country by our noble ancestors. It was a time when five percent of the total population of this country ceased to exist. When more people died in battle than all other wars combined. It was a time when one in four white southern males perished from this earth. These men we honor today, like so many others, fought for the preservation of their homeland and the welfare of their families. To make it simple, a captured Confederate was asked by his captors why he was fighting and he said, because y'all are down here. Sometimes when one looks in a mirror, it is hard to truly see what is there. Therefore, one relies on another for confirmation. So I, I would like to quote a northerner, Washington Roebling. The conduct of the Southern people appears many times truly noble as exemplified. For instance, old men with silver locks lay dead in the trenches side by side with mere boys of 13 and 14. It almost makes one sorry to have to fight against people who show so much devotion to their homes and to their country. So too often when we mention the word Confederate the word slavery soon follows. So I would like to once again set the record straight.
first of all, we have a flag here today that for almost a hundred years flew over sailing vessels which were engaged in transportation of slaves. There were businesses that profited off of slave trading. It's ironic, however, that Southerners are more patriotic to this flag than any other section of the country. And if you're not familiar with the flag that I'm referring to, I'll show it to you. This is, this is the flag right here. This is the one. But we're going to keep it because we think a lot of it too. Because we don't want to offend anyone. It's a fact that Abe Lincoln was known as saying, the war is to preserve the Union. I don't care if it frees all slaves, half the slaves, or none at all. When he made his so-called great speech, the proclamation freeing the slaves, everyone overlooks the key words which are, all slaves are now free in the states of rebellion. He did not have control over states in rebellion, but he did have control over the states that were not. So why didn't he free them? Mr. Lincoln started the income, the national wide income tax to finance the federal government. He had to because when the southern states succeeded, they lost the majority of their incoming revenue. The South was agricultural, and that's where tariffs were placed, so the South had to keep footing the bill, so to speak. On the other hand, the government was encouraging and promoting industrial growth, which was largely up largely up north from the revenue it received from southern states. When I was a small child, what I, my grandfather said to me was his grandfather was a Confederate soldier. He was wounded in the leg. He marched all the time, never knew where he was going and had so little to eat. Sometimes nothing but hickory nuts. Today, I know my great-great-grandfather was Solomon Mitchell. He was wounded at 2nd Manassas. He was part of A.P. Hill's Light Division. A.P. Hill's Light Division was apparently one of the best units on the field because on the deathbeds of both Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, they called for A.P. Hill to bring up his division. So I challenge you, if you don't know your ancestors, check into it. Find out who they are. In doing so, you will find out more about yourself. People, our heritage is under attack. We must put a foot down and let our congressmen know we are proud of our Confederate heritage. We must preserve it. Don't let the liberals take away the song Dixie, remove Confederate monuments, or make it unlawful to fly a Confederate battle flag. We must remember today a people with no heritage in their past will have no future to enjoy tomorrow. Thank you. At this time, I would like to bring uh, up uh, compatriot Mr. Joe Smith. He is going to give you the regimental history of the 1st Tennessee known as Attorney's Infantry. Mr. Smith. First of all, I'd like to give you a little background on Lincoln County during the Civil War. Lincoln County was, uh, uh, as one of General Sheridan's officers said, a hotbed of secessionists. Uh, Lincoln County furnished 22 uh, companies of infantry, uh, at least two regular cavalry companies, part of an artillery battery, and four partisan ranger companies who were cavalry mounted. And they'd look like that second man in line over there from the right. The rest of the guys would look like the ragtag armies of uh, Stonewall Jackson and A.P. Hill, and they're very authentic too. 
But Lincoln County uh, was very active in the Civil War. Uh, there, there are records of over 3,000 men who served from here, and unofficially it said that probably 5,000 men from the county served. Now, we're here to honor two men today from a very unique organization. Uh, we call them the First Tennessee, but that's not their official name. Their official name is the First Confederate Infantry Regiment. And the reason they weren't officially called the First Tennessee is because during the winter of 1860 and 1861, when all of the wrangle was going on in Washington over the right over the uh, rights of the states to to decide their own uh, destiny, Tennessee had not seceded from the Union. Tennessee was the last state to secede from the Union, and uh, about. February of 1861, six states had already seceded. And over in uh, Franklin County, a young lawyer named Peter Turney, who was 34 years of age, had a mass meeting. And uh, well-known people from the surrounding counties, Lincoln County, Bedford County, and Coffee County, met with large numbers of people. And they petitioned the Tennessee State Legislature to allow them to secede from Tennessee and join Alabama. But uh, you know how politicians are. They didn't want to give up those counties. They didn't. But anyway, Peter Turney and some other influential people, two from Lincoln County that I'll mention, were two young, uh, one lo young lawyer named D.W. Holman of Fayetteville and another uh, young man who was in the United States Army serving in the West. His name was James P. Holman. Uh, D.W. Holman and uh, Peter Turney conspired to raise a regiment, and they did. They put together, uh, let me tell you what a regiment consists of first, that's important. A typical Confederate company consisted of 98 men and three officers, and 10 of these companies were put together to form a regiment. Now, companies and regiments remained together throughout the entire war. They weren't transferred around like they are in today's army, but these men all served together and stayed together during the entire Civil War. Uh, regiments were then put together into what's called brigades. And a brigade, uh, as I said, a regiment consisted of usually 10 companies of, uh, of infantry. A brigade consisted of usually five regiments. So you would probably have in a brigade about 5,000 men. You'd have roughly 1,000 in a regiment. But, you know, during that war, that was impossible. And as they went into battle, disease and wounds and death kept depleting them. So by the end of the second year of the war, most regiments were down to 250 to 400 men. That was about all they had. Uh, but anyway, uh, Peter Turney and some influential people put together a regiment consisting of 10 companies. Four of them were from Lincoln County. The remainder were from Franklin County and Bedford County and Coffee County. Uh, these men then presented themselves directly to the Confederate government rather than going through the state of Tennessee, and they were known as the 1st Confederate Infantry. Now, the first is a real honorable designation because that's the first to fight. Uh, later on, uh, after Tennessee uh, seceded from the Union, another regiment was organized up around Nashville from the town, uh, county surrounding Nashville and was designated Manny's First Tennessee. So if you're ever doing research, you'll find sometimes you think there are two First Tennessees, but they weren't. Turney's is known as the First Confederate Infantry, but the men were so proud of their state and they were fighting in Virginia all the time that they referred to themselves as the First Tennessee. They, uh, in fact, uh, as the war progressed, all Tennessee units that were in Virginia were transferred back to Tennessee to fight with the Army of Tennessee, and only three uh, regiments remained to fight with Robert E. Lee. That was the 1st, the 7th, and the 14th Tennessee remained in Virginia and fought in all of the battles that Robert E. Lee fought in. Uh, they were in a brigade known as the Tennessee Brigade. Uh, even though there were three Tennessee regiments and there were two from Alabama, the 5th and the 13th Alabama were with them, they were still known as the Tennessee Brigade and fought in every single battle that uh, Robert E. Lee fought in. Now, that's an authentic representation of their flag, and it shows on the uh, nine battles, but these men were in 33 battles.
33 battles, every battle over there. And uh, that flag you see right there was captured by the 14th Connecticut Infantry at uh, Gettysburg. Now the 1st Tennessee, or the Tennessee Brigade, was the only brigade to make it to the top of the hill in Pickett's Charge. They made it to the top of the hill and were actually into the Federal works when they were captured. Uh, that flag was captured, and in 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt decided to turn, return all the captured battle flags to their states, and uh, that flag and the other flags were returned to the archives in Nashville by Theodore Roosevelt, and that's a copy of it. Uh, uh, these men, uh, brave men you're honoring here today, uh, they suffered untold hardships. And he mentioned A.P. Hill and Stonewall Jackson. These, this brigade uh, was assigned to both of those men. They were in the light division. They were always in the light division. Uh, as he said, when, they ran into, when Lee's army ran into trouble, it was said, bring up the light division. Uh, the first Confederate was usually the point regiment. It was usually the center regiment always into the battles. They were the first to fight at Gettysburg. They were the they opened the Battle of Gettysburg and ended it also. Uh, at Gettysburg, uh, they came up against the Iron Division in the beginning of the battle, and uh, large numbers of them were uh, killed and captured. Uh, their general was captured at this time, and uh, uh, they were also in Pickett's Charge. Now, Pickett's Charge is a misnomer. There were uh, Pickett only led one third of the troops going up that hill at Gettysburg. Uh, uh, and uh, his men never made it to the top as the Tennessee boys did. These men served in many, many battles. As I said, 33. They were in the Seven Days Battles before Richmond. They were in the, uh, at Gettysburg. They were in the Maryland Campaign. They were in the Peninsula Campaign. They were in the Petersburg Campaign. When they left Lincoln County, they had almost 1,000 men. Uh, or the county surrounding here, they had almost a thousand men. When they surrendered at Appomattox, there was only eight officers and 60 men left, that's all. Uh, these men, uh, most of them didn't die in battle. As you know, during the Civil War, on, of those who died, only one of four died in battle. Three of them died of disease. Uh, the uh, After the war, some of uh, these men came back and became uh, real good citizens of Lincoln County. Uh, as I was mentioning, the organizers of the troop, uh, Peter Turney uh, was wounded at uh, Chancellorsville. He was shot through the face. And a bullet came out the back of his neck. His men thought he was dead, but he survived. And he went on to become the first, uh, a chief justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court. And he was governor of the state in the 1890s. And he lived well into the 20th century. Uh, James P. Holman and D.W. Holman, who were organizers of it, uh, dropped out of the regiment during the first year, decided they could better fight back in Tennessee, and came back here and organized other units and fought here. And uh, after the war, they formed, a, went together as law partners and formed a law office called Holman and Holman, which is still in existence up on the, uh, just off the square in Fayetteville there today. But these were brave men who fought uh, for the first Confederate and their unique organization in that they were willing to go before Tennessee had seceded. Now, reading letters from these men, you see that slavery was not an issue with them. Very few of the common folk of Middle Tennessee owned slaves. Uh, it was more patriotism. Uh, in letters I've researched uh, where they have written home, the, the one common word that comes up was that they did not want to be subjugated by a central government. They thought that each state should be able to uh, to decide its own destiny. And they were inspired more by patriotism than anything else. And also, most of the folks who went off from here were of Scots-Irish ancestry. And they were kind of clannish. And when the clan went, they went, you know. Uh, as uh, Robert E. Lee was asked by an English observer one time who were his best soldiers, he said it was the Scots who came by way of Ireland. Uh, now, these men uh, did tremendous duty, and their sacrifice, it's just unbelievable. Most of the time, they had hardly any food. They lived off the land. 
their clothes were always in rags, and they many times they marched for hundreds of miles with no shoes at all. They were always without shoes. One of their and most of the things they had to fight with were captured from the U.S. Army. One of their largest complaints was the inferior shoes furnished by the U.S. Army's contractors. Uh, there were other great units from uh, Middle Tennessee and Fayetteville especially who fought, but uh, the, the first uh, Confederate is very unique. Many of you may have read a book, there's a book that's around your Civil War buff that's uh, entitled Company H, A-Y-T-C-H-E, and it's about a man from the first Tennessee from Columbia. Well, that's not to be confused with this first Tennessee. We have people who ask us about that, but uh, this this first these men called themselves the first Tennessee, but their official title was the first Confederate. Uh, I could go on and on and on. Uh, I, there are a lot of units you can research, but my hobby is researching history of the Civil War, and I chose one unit to research, and that's the uh, first t Confederate. Uh, I've been researching them for about 10 years, and I've located them every day of the war, and someday we hope to publish a, a history of that regiment. Uh, it's up to about 200 pages now, and uh, but we got a few more years to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. May I introduce uh, Mrs. Vicki Holcomb, she is a direct descendant of Mr. Pickett and is the daughter of Terry Pickett. Uh, she will now give the personal history of 2nd Lieutenant George Washington Pickett. Washington Pickett was born January 2nd, 1843 in Lincoln County, Tennessee. He died July 25, 1933. At the age of 18, George Washington Pickett enlisted in the Confederate States Army on September 28, 1861 at George's General Store near Smithland, Tennessee. He enlisted in the 1st Tennessee Company H Tourney Division. Company H was nicknamed the Shelton's Creek Volunteers, men from Lincoln County. George Washington Pickett was sent to Richmond, Virginia for training. On April 27, 1862, he enlisted for the duration of the war and was promoted to second lieutenant. The first battle in which George Washington Pickett fought took place on May 31 through June 1, 1862 at Seven Pines, Virginia. Other battles in which Second Lieutenant fought include Cedar Run, the Second Battle of Bull Run, the Maryland Campaign, which includes the Battle of Harper's Ferry and the Battle of Antietam at Sharpsburg. And he also fought in the Battle of Fredericksburg. At the Battle of Fredericksburg, Colonel Peter Turney was, was wounded and removed from active command. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Confederate Army went into winter quarters at Fredericksburg, Virginia. He then fought in the Battle of Chancellorsville from April 27 through May 5, 1863. General Thomas Stonewall Jackson died from a wound he received at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Lee then took his army north into Pennsylvania. On July 3, 1863, Second Lieutenant Pickett was wounded in Pickett's charge at the Battle of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. On his way back to Virginia, on July 8, 1863, Second Lieutenant Pickett was captured by federal troops and taken to Pennsylvania to a federal hospital 
where he stayed until November 1, 1863. He was then transferred to Point Lookout Prison in Maryland for six days. After the imprisonment at Point Lookout, he was sent to Johnson Island, Ohio, Lake Erie, where he remained until March 14, 1865. The duration of his imprisonment was 23 months. He was released after a prison exchange and arrived in Richmond, Virginia on March 22, 1865. Second Lieutenant Pickett was given a 60-day furlough. During this time, General Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. At the time of the surrender, fewer than 50 officers and enlisted men were still with the unit. From 1st Tennessee, Company H, one corporal and one private remained. After the surrender, 2nd Lieutenant Pickett began his journey home. On May 6, 1865, he was captured in Atlanta, Georgia by Union troops and charged for not taking the oath of allegiance. He was taken to military prison in Louisville, Kentucky. 2nd Lieutenant Pickett did take the oath of allegiance and was released from prison on June 15, 1865. He rode the train to Decker, Tennessee and walked to his home in Lincoln County. His mother did not recognize him when he arrived home on June 18, 1865 at the age of 22. Two years of prison life without enough food, clothing, or medical treatment had taken its toll. George Washington Pickett married Nancy Jane Walker. Four children were born to them. B, Belle, Will, and John Pickett. For the remainder of his life, he lived in Lincoln County. He was a farmer, a justice of the peace, and a member of the New Hope Oddfellows Club. The New Hope Oddfellows Club performed many good deeds. Many years after the war, while Colonel Turney was governor of Tennessee, he asked a member of the first Tennessee where George Pickett was living. When he learned that George Washington Pickett was a farmer in Lincoln County, he said, if George Pickett makes as good a farmer as he did a soldier, he can make a living on a bare rock. Such was his standing and reputation as long as he lived. Second Lieutenant George Washington Pickett of 1st Tennessee Company H, Turney Division, received the Southern Cross of Honor on July 3, 1906. This honor was for duty performed from September 1861 to June 1865. In 1910, Lieutenant Pickett became disabled from the wound he received in the Battle of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on July 3, 1863. After three years of red tape with the U.S. government, he got a pension of about $11 a month. After a distinguished military career and honorable life, 2nd Lieutenant George Washington Pickett died on July 25, 1933. After his death, only six Confederate veterans remained in Lincoln County. In Second Lieutenant George Washington Pickett's obituary in the July 27, 1933 issue of the Lincoln County News, it reads, and I quote, he was an honest man who understood what fair dealing with his fellow man meant in life. Lincoln County never had a more upright citizen. Long live the memory of 2nd Lieutenant George Washington Pickett and his comrades of 1st Tennessee Company H, Turney Division.
At this time, I would like to introduce Miss Anita Shelton. Anita is the president of the Mary Patrick chapter of the Order Confederate Rose and a very active member. She is also my wife, and she is very proud of the fact that she has two children who are direct descendants of Solomon Mitchell. At this time, she will read the personal history of Private Solomon Mitchell. Solomon Mitchell was born January the 20th, 1841. He lived in the Old Salem community in Franklin County, Tennessee. On April the 29th of 1861, at the age of 20, he enrolled for duty as a private of Company F in the 1st Confederate Provisional Army of Tennessee, more commonly known as Turney's Infantry or the 1st Tennessee. On May 1st, the regiment left Tennessee by rail to Lynchburg, Virginia. On June 1st, the unit was moved by rail again to Harper's Ferry to be put under the command of Brigadier General Thomas J. Jackson. Private Mitchell first saw action at the First Battle of Manassas on July of 1861. On March 8th, 1862, his brigade entered the Peninsular Campaign as part of A.P. Hill's Light Division. He was present for the Battle of Gaines Mill and the Seven Days Battle. During this time, the unit became part of Archer's Brigade. It participated in Jackson's Valley Campaign at Cedar Run and went on to action at Orange Courthouse, Manassas Junction, and Second Manassas, where Private Mitchell was wounded on August the 29th. He was back in service for the Battle of Fredericksburg and again for Chancellorsville. A.P. Hill was promoted to Corps Commander after Jackson's death at Chancellorsville. On July the 1st of 1863, A.P. Hill's Third Corps were advancing on a little town in Pennsylvania looking for shoes. Major General Henry Heth's division was in the lead column containing Brigadier General James J. Archer's Brigade. Archer's Brigade advanced through McPherson's Woods where they met head on with the Iron Brigade, one of the Federal Army's most powerful units. Underestimating the enemy's strength, Archer's Brigade advanced too far, thus enabling the 19th Indiana and the 24th Michigan to turn their right flank. Unable to withstand the murderous fire from both front and flank, the Confederates retreated across Willoughby Run. The Iron Brigade came after them, scooping up prisoners, among them Private Solomon Mitchell and General Archer, which to date was the highest ranking Confederate States officer ever captured. The 24th Michigan had nine color bearers killed by the Confederates. By now, both sides concentrated troops into Gettysburg. This would be the largest military battle on the North American continent, heard as far away as 140 miles. That is approximately the distance from Huntsville, Alabama to Nashville, Tennessee. There were over 51,000 casualties in this battle. Taking in consideration the average height of a man laid head to feet, the casualties of this battle would stretch from the Fayetteville Square well past the Alabama state line. It was God's work that Solomon Mitchell was captured on July 1st, 1863, because his brigade was later attached to General Pickett which on July 3rd, 1863, made the famous Pickett's Charge across open ground in murderous musket and cannon fire. Only about one-third of 13,000 men survived this ordeal. On July the 6th, Private Mitchell was received at Fort Delaware as a prisoner of war. He remained there under harsh, humiliating conditions for 15 months 
while his unit was in the middle of all the heavy fighting in Virginia. On October the 11th of 1864, Private Mitchell was exchanged at Camp Lee in a prisoner of war exchange. Believing in the principles of defending his homeland and family from the hostile Yankee butchers, which now he knew firsthand, he went back to the battlefield, which was now the entrenchments around Petersburg, Virginia. He then fought on until April the 2nd, 1865. During the Five Forks battle, the Federals advanced in mass numbers. The fighting intensified. Corps Commander General A.P. Hill was mortally wounded and again, Private Solomon Mitchell was captured. He was sent to another prisoner of war camp in Point Lookout, Maryland. This time he spent three months. He signed his ex on, July the, on June the 29th to the Oath of Allegiance. The following day, he was sent to Deckard Depot in Franklin County, Tennessee, as the war was now over. His records describe him as five foot, nine inches tall, hazel eyes, light hair, fair complexion. He later moved to Lincoln County, Tennessee, where he died on December the 6th, 1911. He was known as a very good and honest man. Captain Ron Warren of the 8th Tennessee Reenactment Group has been very instrumental in the activities of this camp. Uh, I'm going to ask Captain uh, Warren to come forward and uh, discuss some of the conditions and uh, how life was kind of like living in the northern POW camp. Captain Warren. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody that came down here today. Uh, last year when I first met James Shelton, I told him that we'd probably find out that all the people in the Holman Boone camp or the reenactment unit probably were related to each other somehow or another. Sure enough, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mitchell that we're, uh, Solomon Mitchell that we're memorializing here today has a, had a grandson who, uh, uh, is here with me. It was James, a great grandson, great great grandson, and my ancestor also had a great great grandson. That's me. So we're back together wearing gray, like our ancestors were 130 years ago. Uh, turned out that uh, that's not the only connection. But James had a, a, a great uncle, who, along with the great uncle of mine, got shot up by some revenueers one day. So we'll probably find out a little more about the culture of our our ancestors. Uh, longer we study this. As far as the uh, subject of POWs is concerned, uh, the best thing I could think to do would be to read a few excerpts out of uh, J.P. McMurray's The 20th Tennessee. And uh, in a chapter he calls, To the Youth of the South. No doubt you have read from Northern dailies and Northern histories that your fathers treated badly federal prisoners who were confined in Southern prisons during our Civil War. When we hear these charges made, we want you to ask if the southern prisoners who are being confined in northern pens were treated like human beings. Now let us go to a few facts. A record taken from Elmira, New York, in the prison for the three months of March, April, and May said that of the 5,025 southern prisoners, only six had died during these three months. The Elmira Gazette and Buffalo, New York Courier took it upon themselves to ascertain the truth. They found that during the month of March, 495 Confederate soldiers had died. In April, 224. And in May, 265, making a total of 884 against six, as reported by the uh, good people in Washington, D.C. People at Andersonville prisoner, or prison, the, the northern prisoners, uh, they, they were, uh, you've seen pictures of them, looks a lot like the, the Holocaust victims, maybe. Uh, we offered to give those people back and the Union wouldn't take them. They wouldn't send the transport down for them. 
We offered to let them bring down uh, their own food and their own medicine and their own doctors to take care of those prisoners. They wouldn't do it. So if somebody needs to be blamed for the travesties that were uh, occurring at the Andersonville prison, before you make your mind up, keep that in mind. Also, in retaliation for the, uh, the Fort Pillow massacre, which nobody's still sure what went on there, up in uh, Point Lookout, they decided they were going to shoot one Tennessee prisoner a day to make up for the, uh, the grievance. If it weren't for Nathan Bedford Forrest, who said that for every one prisoner shot in prison, he'd kill 100 Yankees, and they took him for his word, that would have happened. Let us see what the treatment of the southern prisoners were like at Camp Douglas, on the banks of Lake Michigan, where in midwinter the thermometer sometimes drops to 40 degrees below zero. We find in the depths of winter six blankets were issued to 160 prisoners, and only one stove was allowed for 10,000 men. Many a poor fellow froze to death on the ground without anything under him or over him except the clothes he had on. Here prisoners were hung up by the thumbs for three or four hours at a time for the least violation of the rules. Rats and dogs were eaten daily when they could be had. Yes, anything to save dear life. The icicles at Camp Douglas hang, uh, hung from the roofs down to about six inches of the ground. At one time, a Negro soldier, who was a guard, began to fire into a squad of about 200 prisoners, killing and wounding five. The officer of the day called out to the guard in the presence of his prisoners, if your ammunition gives out, let me know and I will furnish you more. This was all done without prevocation. Here men were frozen to death by being forced to sleep on the ground without blankets or fire, and the rations were barely enough to keep the body and soul together. It was at this point lookout that the fiendish brutality was practiced on the defenseless unfortunates of the, by, the, uh, by the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry, who will, will never be forgotten or forgiven. Their conduct to the unarmed and hapless stamps them, uh, uh, stamps them as barbarians and cowards unworthy to carry a flag that represents the home of the free and the land of the brave. All, in, all too in defense of the Negro, that Massachusetts did more to enslave than all the rest of the country combined. This was in keeping with their Puritan history. After all, they are the ones who burnt witches. At Fort Delaware, the daily practice of hanging southern prisoners by the thumbs for two or three hours for the least infraction was simply viciousness. At 8 o'clock each morning, the prisoners received their allowance for breakfast, which consisted of a piece of mixed corn and wheat bread, one ounce of salt beef or pork, issued to each prisoner. About 2 p.m., the same amount of bread and one pint of filthy soup was issued, and this to sustain life on the long, cold nights where one stove was allowed for 10,000 men. On one occasion in the prison, a poor boy from Charlottesville, Virginia, was shot dead for throwing a cup of water out of the window of his barracks. On another occasion, General Schoff, who was in charge, ordered a lieutenant to have his hands tied behind him and hung by the elbows until the poor fellow should faint in pain or his shoulder should become dislocated. When a sergeant was detailed to watch the proceedings and go to the relief, relief of the prisoner, should he, if either occurred, it was repeated several times, after which this helpless victim was put in solitary confinement. The number of Union prisoners in the South, 261,000. Number of Confederate prisoners in the North, 200,000. Number of Union prisoners died, 22,576. Number of Confederate prisoners died, 26,535. According to this report of their own Secretary of War, the number of federal prisoners confined in southern prisoners exceeded the southern prisoners confined in northern prisons, 61,000. Yet 4,000 more southerners died in northern prisoners than the northern prisoners in southern prisons. This too, when the north there was lo no lack of anything, their ports were open to all the world, while in the south, everything's were wanted. All her ports were blockaded by the federal fleets. Madison's were de declared contraband of war by the federal government. The south had been stripped of its provisions because it contributed largely to the support of both armies. These figures, according to their own testimony, ought forever to set at rest the false accusations brought against the prison keepers of Salisbury, North Carolina, and Andersonville, Georgia. On Thanksgiving Day in 1864, we were given a whole potato each, a fourth of a loaf of bread, a cup of beans and worms, and a cup of coffee. On Christmas, we got a half loaf of bread each, some meat, and we never enjoyed a Christmas dinner as we did that one. 
The offal of the kitchen was carried out into sl in slatted boxes and emptied in the bay at the privy at low tide. And during a high tide, fragments of meat washed upon the levee, and prisoners would fish those fragments out of the filth of the privy and eat the same. I think this goes to show some of the hardships that uh, was faced by the Confederate soldiers in Union prisons. Of course, any man in a prison camp is going to have a lot of uh, hardships. But like uh, J.P. McMurray said, the North want, didn't want for anything. They had everything they had. It was just a simple case of neglect. Uh, much like the, uh, the men in Huntsville, Alabama, in the un unknown Confederate cemetery at Maple Hill, these men were wounded at Shiloh and through neglect allowed to die. That seems to be the way it was with the federal government at the time. I'd like to ask each of you to go home and maybe call up somebody that, that has a little knowledge on your family background, find out what unit your ancestors served with, regardless of whether they were from the north or the south. But if it turns out that they're from the south, get with some of us and let us know. We can list them and duly note it, find out where their graves are and have memorials for them. And I think that you really would enjoy uh, the feeling that goes with actually knowing what your ancestor did during that war and being able to go and see the actual spots where him and his family were shot and wounded and maybe live. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank all of you once again for coming out, and uh, we really appreciate your support, and I hope you have a good time, and I hope that we uh, somehow or another uh, bring you to a, a point of where you want to go and find who your ancestors are and maybe pitch in and join us and have some good times with the, your fellow Lincoln Countyans. Thank you.
time I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Bradley. He is the Middle Tennessee Brigade Chaplain and a very special friend of mine, Dr. Bradley. Captain Warren, will you advance the colors and Tex as an honor guard to stand beside me as I speak? I like to have close friends around me. We stand here on hallowed ground. We are gathered at the graves of two men, two patriots, who participated in the most tremendous and the most meaningful of the wars that has ever been fought by our nation. I say the most tremendous because this war touched directly the lives of more of our citizens than any other in which we've engaged. I say the most meaningful because this war forged the bonds which would forever keep this a single nation moving forward toward becoming a world power. These men we've gathered to honor and to remember were men of principle. Had they not been, there would have been no parting from their families. There would have been no absence for four long years from their homes. <laughs> There would have been no risk of life. There would have been no wounds. There would have been no captivity. Only dearly held principle could have moved men to those ends. These were men of courage. It took great courage to fight the hardest of all battles, which was the battle of leaving home. In a day and time when Huntsville seemed far away, what must it have been like for these men to go to Virginia, knowing that they would not return until the war was over? These were peaceful men, men who had never heard a shot fired in anger, yet they had the courage to transform themselves into men of war at a time when fighting meant looking your enemy straight in the eye, close range, doing him in before he did the like to you. These were men who knew hard work. Performing was even more physical in those days than it is now. But they exposed themselves to rough living and to excruciating labor in order to fight for their country. They had the courage to face wounds at a time when a gunshot meant maiming for life if you did not die from the infection. These were men of freedom who treasured their ability to come and go under God's blue sky. Yet they courageously risked capture and imprisonment to support their cause. These were men of honor, having considered their options, having counted the cost, they put their hand to the plow and they did not look back. Having enlisted to fight for their country, they drew the sword and they threw away the scabbard, and they fought to the finish. When that finish came, when they were overwhelmed by a flood tide of men and material, they returned to their homes to build up once more what they had lost. They returned to be loyal citizens, abiders of the law, hard workers, servants of the church, honest laborers, and true patriots. It would be wrong to forget these men, it would be wrong to forget what they stood for. Should the time ever come when we are forced to forget principle and courage and honor, we will have made ourselves poor indeed. Should the time ever come when those who upheld these concepts can no longer publicly be honored, we will have become an impoverished nation. It would be a rare treat for us to talk to those two men, how they mustered at Camp Harris, how they made that long trip to Virginia. We would thrill to hear what they said about First Manassas. We would feel our hearts race as they described the seven days. Can you see these men as they held the left of Jackson's line at Second Manassas? Can you hear the command that was given to them? Resolve to die here, men. Resolve to die here. And many of them did die there. These are the men who marched 20 miles, most of it at double time, in order to form into battle at the run, 
to charge into a Union force that threatened to split Lee's army in two. There were fewer than 2,000 of these men in the Tennessee Brigade, but they drove back 12,000 of the enemy. These are the men that wrecked the Army of the Potomac at Fredericksburg, who took part in Jackson's flank march at Chancellorsville, the most fabled march that any man on the American continent have ever made. These were the men who went across the wheat field and the great charge at the third day of Gettysburg, the most legendary attack ever made in any battle, in any war. In the wilderness, at Spotsylvania, at Cold Harbor, at Petersburg, wherever the Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee fought that long battle summer of 1864, these men of the Tennessee Brigade made their presence known. And when the bitter end came at Appomattox, the noble survivors of that brave band were still there, gathered round the tattered remnants of their flag. Proud to the last they were, and they had earned that right, for they had endured. And so their legacy endures, still under attack, and still stoutly defended. Their courage, their honor, their principles still speak to us today. Their symbols are still powerful. During this last week, I have been battling questions and objections to make sure that the Confederate flag flies over the Confederate graves next week when in Tullahoma we rededicate those graves. Can you honestly believe that there are those who object to the flag of the Confederacy flying over Confederate graves? There are. I will fight for that symbol because my great, great grandfather fought for it and fought for it in the same brigade as did these two men that we honor here. Let me speak to that symbol for but a moment. Let me speak to you as if I am the flag of those two men, of Solomon Mitchell and George Washington Pickett. In 1861, when they perceived their rights to be threatened, when those who would alter the form of government of their forefathers were placed in charge, when confronted with more change than they could accept, the mighty men of valor began to gather. This band of brothers, native to the southern soil, pledged themselves to a cause, the cause of defending family and fireside and faith. Between the desolation of war and their homes, they interposed their bodies, and they chose me as their symbol. I am their flag. Their mothers, wives, sweethearts took thimbles and scissors and needle and thread and from silk or cotton or calico, whatever was the best they had, even from the fabric of their wedding dresses, they cut my pieces and stitched my seams. I am their flag. At train stations, and picnic groves on courthouse squares all over the South, the men mustered, and the women placed me in their hands. Fight hard. Conquer if you can. Come back if possible. But above all, maintain your honor. Here is your symbol, they said. I am their flag. They flocked to the mustering grounds, to the drill fields, they experienced the reaching sadness of leaving home. They endured homesickness, illness, boredom, bad food, poor quarters. They looked to me for inspiration. I am their flag. I was at Sumter when they began with jubilation. I was at Big Bethel when the infantry fired its first volleys. I smelled the gun smoke along Bull Run in Virginia and at Belmont on the banks of the Mississippi. I was in the debacle at Fort Donaldson. I led Jackson up the valley. For seven days, I flapped in the turgid breezes of the James River bottoms while McClellan ran from before Richmond. Sidney Johnston died for me at Shiloh, as would thousands of others 
whose graves would be marked sine nomine, without a name, unknown. I am their flag. With ammunition gone, they defended me along the railroad cut at Manassas by throwing rocks. I saw the fields run red with blood at Sharpsburg. Brave men carried me across Doctor's Creek at Perryville. I saw the blue bodies carpet Mary's Heights at Fredericksburg. I saw the gray bodies fall like leaves in the round forest at Stones River. I am their flag. I was a shroud for Stonewall after Chancellorsville. Men ate rats and mule meat to keep me flying over Vicksburg. I tramped across the wheat field with Kipper and Garnet and Armistead. I know the thrill of victory. I know the misery of defeat. I know the bloody cost of them both. I am their flag. When Longstreet broke the line in Chickamauga, I was in the lead. I was the last off Lookout Mountain. Men died to rescue me at Missionary Ridge. I was singed by the wildfire that burned to death the wounded in the wilderness. I was shot to tatters in the bloody angle at Spotsylvania. I saw it all from Dalton to Peachtree Creek, and no worse sight did I see than Kennesaw and New Hope Church. They planted me over the trenches at Petersburg, and there I stayed for many months. I am their flag. I was rolled in blood at Franklin. I was stiff with ice at Nashville. Many good men bade me farewell at Sailor's Creek. When the end came at Appomattox, when the last Johnny Reb left Durham Station, hundreds of them secreted in their clothes fragments of my fabric. I am their flag. During the hard years of so-called Reconstruction, during the distress and dismay of years that so slowly passed by, the veterans, their wives, their sons, their daughters, they loved me. They kept alive the stories of heroism and the legends of valor, and they passed them on to the grandchildren, and they passed them to their children, and so they have been passed to all of you. I am their flag. I have shrouded the bodies of heroes. I have been laved with the blood of martyrs. I am enshrined in the hearts of millions, both living and dead. You salute me with affection and reverence. You keep undying devotion in your heart, for I am history, I am heritage, I am not hatred. I am the memory and inspiration of valor from the past. Look away, Dixieland. I am their flag. At this time, the Order of Confederate Rose will now unveil the markers. If any descendants, especially small children, would like to join this ceremony, please come forward and go with the ladies to your ancestor. Upon arrival at the graves, please form a circle and hold hands. Each circle is a reminder of the undying love and devotion that lives on in each of us, each of these descendants.
and ever living God, we yield unto thee the most high praise and hearty thanks for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all thy saints who have been the choice vessels of thy grace and the lights of the world in their several generations. Most humbly beseeching thee to give us grace so to follow the example of their steadfastness in thy faith and obedience to thy holy commandments, that at the day of the general resurrection, we with all those who are of the mystical body of thy son may sit on his right hand and hear that his, that his most joyful voice. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Grant this, O Father, for the sake of the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Load. Bleak fire to the left. Ready. Aim. Elevate, elevate, elevate. Hey! Load! Thank you, boy. Leak to the left. Aim. Thank you. This concludes the service.